Our first talk today is going to be from Dr. Dugu Uguntunch, um, who is currently a research fellow at Middle East Technical University um, with a, and I can't pronounce this very well, Marie Curie's Gordowska Fellowship on collective, on collective scientific knowledge. Um, Dr. Ugen Tunch has a PhD jointly from the universities of Helsinki and Heidelberg. And today she's going to be talking about collective scientific knowledge without a collective subject. And without any further ado, I'll hand over to her. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone on my behalf uh, and start sharing my screen with you. So you're seeing my PowerPoint presentation, right? Yep. Okay. And let's begin. Just a second. So large research collaborations constitute an increasingly prevalent form of research in many scientific fields. Uh, and the concept of distributed cognition has uh, been used in the last decades as a model for thinking about uh, research collaborations in the philosophy of science. Uh, Karin knorr Setina's and Ron Gier's analyses of high energy physics uh, would be the most famous examples, I guess. Uh, so they both conceive the processes of knowledge production in these experiments in terms of distributed cognition, but their accounts regarding the epistemic subject of knowledge thus produced are quite different. So while Knorr Setina argues for an irreducibly collective subject of knowledge, uh, Gier argues for eliminating the epistemic subject altogether and suggests using uh, the passive voice in describing collectively produced knowledge. So neither of these views are easy to assimilate within an epistemological account, uh, I argue, since epistemology traditionally operates within an individualist framework. They both entail that we should deny knowledge to individuals when processes of knowledge production are distributed. I will argue that epistemology should be extended in a way that can accommodate collectively produced knowledge, uh, but that we would have a serious problem if we deny scientific knowledge to individuals. So if the members of a large collaboration cannot be said to know, we have to accept the absurd conclusion that either no one or only a super individual entity learns from the most successful research collaborations we have. I will argue instead for conceiving research collaborations in terms of a cognitive system that produces, not possesses knowledge, which can eventually be possessed though not produced by constituent individuals uh, when two conditions are met. Firstly, the distributed process, the distributed research process should be reliable in producing scientific evidence. And secondly, there should be a reliable distributed process of internal criticism for scrutinizing the reliability of the collectively produced scientific evidence. I will analyze both conditions in terms of distributed first order and second order justification, where I put forward a reliabilist account of justification that is compatible with epistemic dependence. I will conclude that the notion of epistemically dependent knowledge enables us to attribute knowledge to individuals when knowledge production is irreducibly social. So scientific inquiry is at bottom a highly structured cognitive process. Cognitive processes are generally thought to occur exclusively within organismic boundaries. So as a cognitive process, scientific inquiry is intuitively something that happens in the head of the individual scientist. But he rarely finds such a complex form of cognition like scientific inquiry is realized without substantial reliance on scientific instruments and other experts, past and present. The various kinds of factors external to the individual agent seem to play not only supportive, but constitutive roles in the production of scientific knowledge. Such epistemic dependence is a structural feature in large research collaborations where individual agents coordinate their diverse expertise cognitive efforts and interactions with various art epistemic artifacts in ways that give rise to what may, we may call complex cognitive systems. Research collaborations are formed to realize highly complex cognitive tasks, complex cognitive tasks or big questions uh, that typically surpass the bounds of individual expertise and cognitive capacity. Thus, they can be say, said to produce knowledge at the in, super individual or epistemic system level. The concept of distributed cognition 
uh, which originated in cognitive science, is grounded in the non-individualist or externalist premise that cognition is not necessarily an intercranial process or an organismic process, but can extend to external epistemic sources such as scientific instruments, as well as incorporate cognitive activities of multiple agents. So distributed cognition provides a useful framework for analyzing collective knowledge production in terms of division of cognitive labor. And it has already been employed in the philosophy of science to describe collective research processes in certain fields like uh, high energy physics. So while presenting uh, a very useful model for examining the epistemic structure of collaborative science, Distributed cognition raises serious doubts, however, about whether we can still conceive scientific knowledge as a state of the traditional subject of epistemology, namely the individual. While Gare and uh, Knorr Setino offer similar descriptions of how knowledge is produced in collaborative experiments in terms of distributed cognition, their account differs significantly when it comes to identifying the epistemic subject of collectively produced knowledge. For Knorr Setina, the epistemic subject in the case of high energy physics experiments is the experiment itself. The whole collaboration together with the instruments it employs and all the communicative and practical activities and interactions that weave the people and the instruments into a unitary entity presents a novel epistemic subject. So for Knorr Setina, the subjectivity of the individual subject is erased and through a distributed cognition, and through distributed cognition, the experiment not only becomes a supra-individual entity per se, but an epistemic subject as it acquires, uh, quote unquote, a stream of collective self-knowledge or a sort of consciousness. Pierre, on the other hand, finds such an ascription of collective subjectivity to research collaborations too much of an ontological commitment. He argues that we can view certain research collaborations as distributed cognitive systems because they realize a cognitive task, not because they exhibit a whole cognitive uh, Co cognitive properties that imply agency. Thus, we do not need to postulate distributed cognitive agents in order to speak about distributed cognitive systems. In particular, we do not need to endow such systems with mental states, such as knowledge or its prerequisite belief. He maintains instead that we should characterize them in a depersonalized or impersonal way, so that we would say things like, this experiment has shown that P, or this experiment leads to the conclusion that P, he envisions that the developing science of cognition uh, could allow us to redefine cognition, cognition as a technical rather than mentalistic term even, and to leave behind the assumption that if knowledge is produced, there must be an epistemic subject, the thing that knows that comes to be known. This is a quotation from uh, Knorr Setina directly. So I think both these accounts are problematic. Let's begin with uh, the irreducibly collective uh, subject account. So both the strategy of conceiving collective knowledge in a non-subjective or impersonal way and that of postulating collective sub epistemic subjects are in conflict with the, individualist, the individualistic perspective of traditional epistemology, according to which knowledge is a cognitive state of the individual. Distributed cognition provides us with a framework in which we can consider this core individualistic assumption and talk about distributed or collective knowledge. Is this increasingly being done in social epistemology? I maintain, however, that this extension or revision of traditional epistemology shouldn't go as far as postulating distributed or collective epistemic subjects or endorsing an exclusively impersonal view of knowledge in case of distributed cognition. Both these strategies are problematic and collective production of scientific knowledge doesn't present, present us with a forced choice between these two. So the collective subject account is problematic primarily due to the unnecessarily high degree of ontological commitment it has to make. Firstly, research collaborations do not seem prima facie to manifest subjective properties such as consciousness, reflectivity, care, or self-knowledge. Knorr Setina attributes uh, the high energy physics experiments precisely such subjective pro properties, but does so without putting forward an explicit ontological argument that would warrant such an attribution. In order to warrant the postulation of collective subjects, one has to demonstrate that the collective accomplishment of a cognitive task entails a collective mind. To put this in terms of distributed cognition, one has to show at least how distributed cognition implies distributed mental states. Such an account has to go beyond joint actions and argue for irreducible collective subjective properties. 
For justification of such an inference from distributed cognition to irreducibly collective or social epistemic subjects, we can turn to other accounts that similarly advocate, advocate high commitment positions. Because as I said, uh, Sitina doesn't offer a detailed ontological or epistemological argument. Even. More recently, Alexander Byrd and Orestes Palermos argued for genuinely or irreducibly collective scientific knowledge. Bird, like Knorr Cetina, invokes Durkheim's concept of organic solidarity in grounding distributed cognitive systems as genuine epistemic subjects. Scientists in a research collaboration for Bird compose a genuine social entity on the basis of their mutual interdependence uh, due to the division of scientific labor, which implies a distribution of cognitive subtasks, not merely in a quantitative, but also in a qualitative man manner, namely in accordance with the heterogeneity of expertise required to uh, investigate the research question. He then goes from the division of scientific labor to irreducibly collective epistemic states via a functionalist argument. The collective entity realizes a cognitive function, which consists in cognitive activity geared towards a certain goal. And we can explain a cognitive function the best by attributing intentional states to the target system. So the argument goes. The system as a whole can be said to have a cognitive, a cognitive or epistemic state on the base, basis of accomplishing a cognitive function, even if no individual member of the system is in that state. Thus, there can be scientific knowledge of the group without any individual knowing. Bert doesn't even restrict this account to distributed cognitive systems with clearly defined tasks, but extends to wider science on the basis of epistemic interdependence of the scientific com community, calling the all of science a single entity. A core concern here is obviously that Bird's account is actually not able to differentiate between unified cognitive systems and loosely organized epistemic communities. And the framework of distributed cognition loses arguably its conceptual role in accounting for collective knowledge. Epistemic interdependence in, in the broad, broad sense can be said to characterize all human epistemic endeavors. And we can clearly not speak of an epistemic subject who is absolutely autonomous in producing knowledge. In this regard, Bird is not in a position even to delineate an actively interacting epistemic community from its long past contributors, since finding theories, inventions live much longer than their originators. This directly leads to the worry that the scientific, the subject of scientific knowledge is inflated to the point of meaninglessness. Palermos offers a similarly strong uh, definition of distributed cognitive systems, which nonetheless delineates distributed cognitive systems from broader communities of knowledge. His account draw, draws from dynamic systems theory and can be summarized thus. Uh, there is a distributed cognitive system if and only if continuous and reciprocal interactions between constituent members give rise to an integrated system with novel non-aggregative properties. So for Palermo's collective knowledge that arises in such a distributed cognitive system is a special kind of group knowledge, one that is not summative. Palermo's argues for the further conclusion that the emergent system is an irreducible group entity, which can also be seen as a group mind. The reason is that the emergent distributed cognitive systems exhibit, for him, socio-cognitive properties that do not belong to any individual member. Individual cognitive systems are characterized by cooperative interactions between the functionally parsed uh, constituent parts and subparts of the system, like memory, motor control, and so on. So this criterion for Palermos applies to distributed cognitive systems in the same way it does to individual or biological cognitive systems. Distributed cognitive systems in general are organized through the coupling of multiple cognitive systems uh, through continuous and reciprocal interactions and by virtue of functional equivalence or parity, they also deserve the status of cognitive systems. Further, in the case of distributed systems, uh, in case distributed systems can accomplish the same cognitive fun functions as biological systems, like memory, for example, uh, or decision-making or belief formation, the resulting cognitive or epistemic states are those of the system as a whole, not in an aggregative or summative sense, but in an irreducible sense, even if no constitute member manifests them. So besides the costly ontological commitment to collective epistemic subjects, these and similar accounts ex explicitly acknowledge the probability of a scenario where we can rightly attribute knowledge of a scientific discovery to literally no scientist. This undesirable cognition, I, uh, conclusion, I think, 
rests partly on a conflation of collective processes and their properties with the outcomes of such processes. Sometimes a task, task consists merely in a performance, but in many other cases, there is an output distinct from the per performance that brought it about. So in this regard, research collaborations ultimately produce scientific propositions. And I doubt that it is an appealing conclusion to say that some scientific propositions are not known by anyone, but uh, possibly a super individual entity. Palermo's argument proceeds from collective performances to emergent collective properties, such as epistemic responsibility. I think one can convincingly argue that distributed cognitive systems have weakly emergent collective properties. And in the case of research collaborations, the required expertise for implementing the collectively agreed research design, data collection, and analysis methods, manipulation and coordination of instruments, and so on, is a property of the system as a whole, as well as properties such as the reliability and efficiency of the research process in yielding credible empirical evidence. Such weakly emergent properties could be among the determinants of whether accepting a scientific proposition counts as knowledge. However, it is not clear what would be gained by attributing strongly emergent subjective or agentive properties, such as collective intentionality, consciousness, motivations, or beliefs to research collaborations. The distributed research process realized by a collaboration is primarily one of establishing scientific evidence for a proposition by implementing a methodological plan. It is not a process of belief formation. To turn to the uh, no subject account, we can admit that conceiving scientific knowledge as impersonal knowledge or knowledge without a subject has some conceptual advantages and a certain appeal. Scientific knowledge is at a fundamental level, a system of statements that are interwoven via logical operations and methodological rules. In this respect, scientific knowledge can be regarded as objective knowledge in proper sense, in contradistinction to subjective knowledge, which is a cognitive phenomenon, specifically a form of belief. Although Gier doesn't specify what he means by impersonal knowledge, beyond suggesting that we reformulate knowledge attribution statements in passive form, his impersonal knowledge can lend itself to be interpreted in a way quite similar to Popper's objective knowledge. But the concept of objective knowledge doesn't tell us by itself anything about the processes of knowledge production, which establish the empirical justification for the targeted system of statements or where this kind of knowledge resides. Does it reside in individual minds, groups of minds, or in books, articles, or databases? It mainly refers to the outcome of an epistemic process, which in turn can be regarded as mental content, as well as a material system of external signs. Thus, the concept of objective knowledge doesn't imply any commitment to any epistemic subject, either in its production or its position. Consequently, we still have to ask the question of what exactly is collective in collective scientific knowledge, to which we can in principle give two answers. We can say either that it is collectively produced knowledge or that it is collectively possessed knowledge, or maybe in some cases both. The way Gear analyzes research collaborations through the concept of distributed cognition leads us to the first option. Research collaborations produce objective knowledge, like a scientific finding, by realizing collectively the complex cognitive processes that are required for its establishment. These processes, processes typically involve combining various kinds of background knowledge, in other words, expertise, interacting with various scientific instruments or epistemic artifacts, and organizing various cognitive activities into a coherent procedure, like analyzing data, drawing inferences, and so on. Collective production of knowledge is also a feature of uh, Knorstetina's, Bird's, and Palermos's analyses. Uh, the core difference between these two perspectives uh, however, is how they answer the question as to the epistemic subject of knowledge does produce. This question addresses, as I have said, the seed of knowledge. For Gier, we do not need to answer this question. We do not have to assume an epistemic subject that knows what comes to be known. For others, the, this subject, uh, the subject that knows, is the experiment, the scientific community, or the collaboration. So it's an irreducibly collective subject. While scientific knowledge is in one respect clearly objective knowledge, which can reside in systems of material external science like printed in books, it would be a far-fetched conclusion, I think, uh, to say that it can reside solely in this manner. We can say that it will be 
no, can we say that, that it will be known that the universe is expanded, expanding, even if the world enters another dark age and nobody is left who understands theoretical physics? The no subject account of collectively produced knowledge leads us, just like the collective subject account, to the absurd conclusion that nobody comes to know what is established in some of the most successful cases of scientific research, such as the empirical confirmation of uh, the Higgs boson. I think a much more commonsensical position is to say that objective knowledge implies subjective knowledge. Uh, Raimo Tuomela also hints at such an implication by saying that such knowledge is not an abstract entity floating around in some kind of platonic third world. Rather, it is knowledge that some actual agent or agents actually have or have had as contents of their appropriate mental states. Thus, we should be able to say that research collaborations produce knowledge in a distributed manner. But it is the individual scientists who come to know the outcomes of the distributed cognitive process. However, the traditional epistemological concept of knowledge, as I said, uh, is that of subjective knowledge, thus a mental cognitive phenomenon, and more specifically, a particularly valued form of belief. It is generally the qualities of the belief forming process that raises it to the level of knowledge, in addition to the qualities of the belief's content. From a virtue reliabilist perspective, for instance, knowledge is the belief in a true proposition that is formed via the exercise of a reliable cognitive competence. From an internalist perspective, it is a true belief which is supported by consciously available good reasons. In any case, the processes whereby knowledge is produced cannot be divorced from it, as they are the source of its justification. This is exactly what happens in distributed cognitive systems, however. The agentive constituents of the system might come to entertain true beliefs, beliefs by accepting the outcome, but they are never sufficiently justified in doing so. The problem with distributed processes of scientific justification for the epistemologist stems from the fact that the traditional individualistic view of knowledge involves epistemic autonomy. So epistemic subjects can be said to know if they are solely or primarily responsible in the production of this knowledge. If we admit that objective knowledge implies subjective knowledge, as I argued, the traditional individualism of epistemology leads us directly to a problem in the case of distributed cognition. We either have to postulate a collective epistemic subject who solely has the justification for accepting a system of propositions, or we have to provide an account of how the individual scientist can be said to know without having the justification to do so. In either case, we ironically end up going radically against the individualistic premise. Namely, we deny either the individuality of the epistemic subject or uh, the requirement for epistemic autonomy. I propose a more nuanced account, which allows that individuals can have sufficient justification non-autonomously, which grounds my position that scientific knowledge can be collectively produced and individually known. So the most parsimonious and plausible way, I think, to save both subjective knowledge of scientific propositions and the premise that the proper epistemic subject is the individual goes through recognizing the requirement for, uh, reconsidering the requirement for epistemic autonomy and updating our view of knowledge uh, to accommodate epistemic dependence. We can then be in a position to formulate an alternative account of collective scientific knowledge by conceiving research collaborations as distributed cognitive systems that produce knowledge, which can eventually be possessed by constituent individuals when certain conditions are met. Uh, first, I'll state that research collab collaborations are distributed cognitive systems for production of objective knowledge. And second, that individual collaboration members are the proper subject of knowledge, subjects of knowledge. So in research collaborations, the output is not a collective mental state, such as belief, but a system of scientific propositions, which stands in inferential relations to the reported data, given the documented methodological procedures. Thus, as far as we see the product as knowledge, it is knowledge only in the objective, non-mental sense. We can alternatively say that the distributed cognitive process is only one of evidence generation in support of collectively made assertions. Either way, the outcome is not knowledge in the subjective sense. I believe that the force of the collective subject argument rests on the implicit intuition that epistemic dependence is not compatible with knowledge. 
Strong anti-individual perspectives on collective knowledge, such as those of Bird and Palermos, arguably still conceive epistemic justification in traditional individualistic terms. They seem to assume, namely, that attributing a belief the status of knowledge requires that the processes of justification that support the belief should be autonomous. In other words, they should be the primary target of epistemic credit or blame. Since the individual scientist in a research collaboration is not primarily creditable with the successes of the distributed research process, there should be a collective subject or agent who is thus creditable. Thus, epistemic dependence would lead us to postulate collective subjects only if we assume that knowledge requires sufficient justification on the basis of cognitive agency. However, Pritchard's formulation of positive epistemic dependence gives us a conception of knowledge that commits us to a weaker form of anti-individualism. And this formulation might come in handy. So positive epistemic dependence uh, is when an epistemic subject can come to know come to know that P by exercising a degree of cognitive agency that is not sufficient for knowing that P through enabling factors that are external to the subject's cognitive agency. From the perspective of a weak epistemic and anti-individualism, one can be said to know in a way that is dependent on enabling external factors if one's agency plays a significant but not necessarily a primary role in one's epistemic success. One formulation of weak epistemic anti-individualism can be found in an earlier work by Palermos, where he argues that in certain cases, knowledge can be creditable to social factors as well as to the individual, and also in Pritchard's weak cognitive ability condition on knowledge. So according to the weak ability condition on knowledge, one knows that P only if one's epistemic success is due to a significant degree, not primary degree, to one's manifestation of the relevant cognitive agency. So in the following, I will go into how we can conceive knowledge enabling external factors with respect to the distributed cognitive systems in science. A research collaboration implements a comp complex research plan that requires the effective coordination of various research activities that are globally geared towards a unitary goal, such as establishing evidence in support of a scientific theory. These activities or subtasks typically require diverse expertise, simultaneous manipulation of multiple scientific instruments or data collection at, at different times on, and, and places. Thus, the evidence towards the truth of a scientific proposition is established in a distributed manner. We can call the process whereby this evidence is established distributed first order justification. The constituent members of a research collaboration do not have this kind of complex first order justification. What they typically have is partial first order justification. However, they can reliably form true beliefs by accepting a scientific proposition that is empirically established through a distributed research process of which they implemented a part. The reliability of such an epistemically dependent belief formation process refers in significant part to the reliability of the distributed research process itself, which constitutes one of the enabling external factors we are looking for. The reliability of a distributed research process implies that the individual pieces of information contributed by the members of the collaboration are true sufficiently more often than not. And they cohere into a unified body of scientific evidence necessary for asserting the scientific claim put forward by the collaboration. That is, on the one hand, the organization of the distributed cognitive system should realize an efficient division of scientific labor and reliable flow of information. These pertain to the properties of the distributed cognitive system that creates and implements a research plan. On the other hand, the research should manifest theoretical, methodological, and experimental virtues such as valid inferential structure, good research design, and reliable scientific technological infrastructure. These latter are related to the properties of objective knowledge the cognitive system is set to generate. Together, these two factors constitute the epistemic competence of the cognitive system as a whole to produce epistemically valuable outputs, such as true empirical propositions. The distributed epistemic competence gives us the complete first order justification for the system of scientific propositions put forward by a research collaboration. How about second order justification? Following Ernest Sosa's uh, twofold distinction between animal and reflective knowledge, we can conceive scientific knowledge as a species of reflective knowledge. That is, 
A case of knowledge, which not only implies that one reaches true beliefs through the exercise of reliable cognitive skills or dispositions, but also that one has a positive judgment regarding the reliability of the skills or dispositions in question. In other words, animal knowledge can en enjoy merely first-order justification, while reflective knowledge requires both first-order and second-order justification. So generally speaking, while Epistemic support for the proposition P constitutes first order justification. Epistemic support for the reliability of the processes whereby one's belief that P is formed constitutes second order justification. So good calibration of the astronomer's telescope gives the astronomer second order justification for the accuracy of the measurements made with it. Or my reasons for believing that somebody's testimony that P is based on that person's knowledge that P uh, constitute my second order justification for believing that P. In this regard, the objective reliability of the research process, namely the epistemic competence of the distributed cognitive system to produce objective knowledge is only a necessary condition for acquiring sub subjective scientific knowledge through reliance on the distributed research process. A further requirement is that one can positively evaluate the epistemic competence of the distributed cognitive system and thereby the reliability of the distributed uh, research process. This evaluation gives us second order justification for the scientific propositions put forward by the research collaboration. In the scientific context, second order justification concerns the assessments of reliability regarding the data, methods, instruments, or the track record of other experts as informants. The whole body of such assessments constitute second order justification that the resulting scientific propositions are the outcome of a reliable process of scientific justification. A research collaboration has to aim for effective control of various sources, of, or sources or kinds of error. In a distributed cognitive system, second order justification may also be distributed. When the required reliability assessments are made via a distributed social process, where different collaboration members realize different parts of the uh, whole reliability assessment task, we have such a distributed second order justification process. This comprises a wide range from calibration of instruments to comparison of independent calculations and nest review committees. A distributed cognitive system can have distributed higher order regulative mechanisms based on social practices, practices to achieve this, which we can call as a whole the distributed social process of criticism. The reliability of the social process of criticism implies that the collaboration actively monitors, mon monitors source of error and has the necessary social and technological means at its, at its disposal to detect and fix errors when they are present. A reliable social distributed process of criticism would be organized so as to make use of available expertise and resources in the most efficient and effective way, and can do so by relying on the already established social organization of a research collaboration. In the high energy uh, physics experiments, uh, for example, the distributed process of criticism involves horizontally organized cross-checking and monitoring tasks, uh, validation mechanisms such as sister experiments like the ATLAS and CMSS experiments, as well as vertically organized review process, uh, processes realized by nested work groups, panels, and committees. Together with the high transparency and ongoing record keeping uh, of all aspects of the research process, the distributed process of critis criticism uh, realized uh, at CERN gives the collaboration members second order justification for accepting the findings and conclusions. Following uh, Pritchard's formulation I've uh, shared of positive epistemic dependence, the reliability of the distributed social process of criticism thus gives us the other enabling external factor we are looking for. The reliability of the distributed research process and the reliability of the distributed social process of criticism together determine whether the acceptance by an individual member of a collaboration of uh, collaboration of the scientific proposition put forward by the collaboration counts as knowledge. The cognitive agencies of collaboration members still play a significant part in the explanation of their individual knowledge, since they both significantly contribute to the distributed process of research and its criticism, and are well informed about the reliability of the scientific justification for the propositions they come to accept. Thus, they also satisfy a weak cognitive ability condition on knowledge.
So in conclusion, we can combine the two knowledge enabling external factors under an account of epistemically dependent knowledge in distributed cognitive systems. An epistemic subject A can come to know that P by relying on the distributed cognitive process X of which evidence for P is the outcome. If X is a reliable process for establishing the evidence that would be sufficient for knowing that P. And there's a reliable social process of criticism for evaluating and maintaining the reliability of X it is contemporaneous with X and available to A. Typically, this is a process of internal criticism, internal to the collaboration. So we can minimally talk about justified epistemic dependence when these two conditions are met. If it is further the case that the scientific propositions are true, uh, then we can attribute the collaboration members individually epistemically dependent knowledge. So in relation to my criticism of the no subject and collective subject accounts of uh, collective scientific knowledge, which resonated their rejection of individual subjective knowledge of scientific propositions established via distributed research processes. I would li lastly like to reiterate my concern that, that this rejection leads us to uh, an absurd or undesirable conclusion that no one actually learns from uh, the most successful research collaborations we have. Furthermore, if the members of a large collaboration cannot be said to know, even in the presence of efficient and reliable social mechanisms for scrutinizing the reliability of the complex body of evidence. Scientists outside of the collaboration who are working in the same discipline, let alone other scientists and lay people, can be in no way sent, said, uh, said to have any justification to accept the results and thus be in a position to know. Conceiving collective scientific knowledge as collectively produced objective knowledge allows us, on the other hand, to accommodate truly, truly distributed cognitive processes of scientific justification. And the concept of epistemically dependent knowledge allows us to retain the commonsensical intuition that objective knowledge implies subjective knowledge. Thus, collective scientific knowledge fruitfully prompts us to, recon to reconsider processes of scientific justification without necessarily leading to a dilemma regarding its epistemic subject. Uh, I can stop here and Thank you for your time and attention. And I guess stop sharing my slides. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Gugu. Um, I thank you. So we now have, um, hang on. We now have a, a response from Ishan Demirkaya. Ishan is currently an MA student at in philosophy at Bill Kent University. Uh, prior to that, she holds a BA in philosophy from Koch University, and I'll hand over to her straight away. Uh, initially, I'd like to thank Dr. Tufan Kimas and Dr. Bill Rinch and you all for making this conference happen. Secondly, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Uh, Duygu Uyguntunç, for this amazing paper and presentation. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, well, you po pointed out uh, the conflict regarding knowledge between the distributed cognitive systems and the traditional epistemology, and um, it is briefly as uh, follows. Knowledge in the traditional epistemology is individualistic and it involves ep uh, epistemic autonomy, which implies that an epistemic subject is primarily responsible in the production of knowledge. And let us call this uh, the epistemic autonomy premise. However, in a scientific research collaboration, which is a distributed system, an epistemic subject has, a, uh, has an epistemic dependence. Let's call this epistemic dependence premise. And it implies that no epistemic subject is absolutely responsible for or autonomous in the production of knowledge. Therefore, what is produced by a scientific uh, research collaboration is not justified as knowledge in the traditional epistemological sense. In order to solve this problem, you lay out a strategy in which instead of uh, strong cognitive ability condition on knowledge, which implies the epistemic autonomy premise, you go for the weak cognitive ability condition on knowledge. This condition implies that an epistemic subject comes to know that P only if her epistemic success relies on the epistemic subject's manifestation of the relevant cognitive ability to a significant degree. 
However, this manifestation of the relevant cognitive ability by epistemic subject is not su uh, sufficient for knowing that P by means of knowledge enabling factors that are external to the epistemic subject. In parallel, your strategy involves a way of justifying this epistemic dependence, which results from the external so, uh, knowledge enabling factors and combining it to the weak cognitive ability condition on knowledge so that you will get an epistemic competence that is as good as epistemic autonomy regarding knowledge in the traditional sense. In order to justify this epistemic uh, dependence, you count on the reliability of the distributed research process, which depends on uh, initially the properties of the distributed system, and secondly, the properties of the objective knowledge. Also, the reliability of criticism, which depends on the reliability of the distributed research process, is another requirement for acquiring knowledge in the traditional sense in your strategy. Regarding uh, your strategies uh, to solve the problem, I have four questions. Initially, I'm not quite sure of that. Your strategy in including the reliability of the distributed research process and the reliability of criticism could solve the problem. Because one can claim that an epistemic subject may not have knowledge regarding the reliability of the distributed research process and the reliability of criticism. Suppose a distributed cognitive system composed of the medical experimenters and the participants of the medical experiment for uh, COVID-19 vaccine. The experimenters should inform the participants about the course of the experiment, which involves just vaccination. However, the experimenters should not bias the participants in order not to influence the experiment. Thus, some of the intentions of the experimenters must remain hidden, and they do not inform some of the participants regarding the placebo effect. In such a case, I am not sure of that. The participants rely, rely on the distributed research process and the reliability of criticism. Secondly, what determines the significant degree of the relevant cognitive ability that is manifested by the epistemic subject is open to question. My third worry is that what grounds your strategy, which is the claim that belief, in, uh, belief formation is a mental agent of uh, subjective activity, whereas the formation of a system of scientific propositions is objective activity, is open to discussion. One can dodge this conflict by combining the distributed cognition and the predictive processing paradigm, claiming that, well, belief formation is no different than a system of scientific propositions formation, because both involve the same inferential processes. My last worry is that your criticism of Palermo's argument from the distributed cognition combined with the dynamical systems theory is subject to discussion. It holds that epistemic continuous interaction premise is not sufficient for claiming a group mind. And I totally agree with that. However, one can escape from this criticism through including additional premises, such as openness, complexity, nonlinearness, nearly decomposability, nestedness, self-assembly, non-modularity, and so on. Through that, one can get a group mind, which is functionally analogous to subjective mind. So these are my worries. Thank you. You're on mute, do you? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, brilliant questions, which would uh, really help us to carry the discussion further. Uh, I'll just take a note of the last one. Yes, to begin with the first, and please could you remind me if I omit anything, uh, because I tried to take note of uh, all of them, but I might have missed one. Uh, so the first question, uh, if I remember uh, correctly, uh, was, uh, to put it in different words, uh, let's say a blinding procedure or something like that, for example, in the research process. Uh, so I guess I was not uh, like very um, clear in my for formulation of distributed research processes because uh, blinding is a uh, par excellence, a, a very pertinent example uh, of um, a distributed research process because where you have uh, blinding, uh, you, uh, separate the research group at least into two 
and uh, you deny information to one party uh, that you make available to the other group. So it is in principle impossible uh, that uh, either group has the full information or the full justification for what, what is going on. Uh, it is intentionally distributed. Uh, the process is intentionally distributed that way in order to achieve a higher reliability than a non-blinded non procedure. Uh, so what is going on there uh, is exactly distributed first order justification. Uh, it is not full first order justification as uh, would be if uh, all of the evidence and the method of its generation was equally available and understandable to all participant members. It is not, there is information uh, closure. So it is distributed. So they have to combine uh, their uh, respective parts of information uh, into a coherent whole. So there you exactly have the situation where you have to refer to uh, a second order mechanism, a second order justificatory mechanism where you justify the blinding procedure as providing more reliable knowledge than a non-blinded procedure. So since you know that the procedure is blinded and blinding uh, yields a more reliable research process, and since you are available of the results, uh, as well as that the blinding procedure was successful, uh, you are in a position to know just uh, because you uh, have available uh, the second order justification process, although you only have partial first order justification. So that would be uh, my response. And yes, blinding is a perfect example of how to distribute the research process. Uh, so your second question, if I have not omitted one uh, in between the two, I, I suspect I might have omitted one. Uh, so what if mental processes are also uh, just information processing? Uh, so your question was, I guess, similar to this. Um, so yeah, uh, there are some such accounts in the literature also in the past. I, uh, as far as I uh, remember, some radically externalist uh, perspectives would be uh, quite uh, would come quite close to uh, such accounts. I remember also of Armstrong's, for example, radically uh, reliableist uh, view uh, on knowledge, uh, where you can just have true propositions via, uh, a, let's say, mentally um, blind procedure. Uh, I would argue against such a position, at least. Uh, in epistemology. Uh, although I advocate a reliableist in general uh, position, uh, so I argue for uh, mostly external uh, justification. Uh, in case of scientific knowledge, at least, uh, where I, uh, which I'm talking about, uh, we cannot uh, get rid of all internalist elements, and we shouldn't. That would be my perspective. And uh, I would ask, uh, so in terms of epistemology, not in terms of philosophy of mind, what we would really gain by um, regarding mental processes simply as processes of uh, information processing like a computer does. Because then we wouldn't be able to incorporate into our account uh, anything like good or sufficient reasons for uh, believing or accepting a proposition or uh, having uh, or be being able to being in a position to make a positive evaluation of the processes whereby one uh, arrives at a judgment uh, and i think in case of scientific knowledge which is uh, which i following sosa described as a species of uh, reflective knowledge uh, i don't think this would uh, give us an adequate account at all so one i don't think one can acquire um, such a complex and sophisticated form of knowledge uh, using a blind information processing system, even if it is biological or external. And uh, your last question. So I'm not completely sure if I understood it uh, correctly, but you um, brought in some other concepts from the dynamic systems framework. Uh, and uh, you questioned why we still cannot uh, think of a group mind when we introduce many um, properly collective properties, if uh, I understood so, because they are properties of the system. They are like properties of 
uh, distributed system. So uh, at this point, uh, like on a broader perspective, I think uh, that my account, as far as I have developed it in this uh, work in progress paper, so it is pretty much the first, first or second draft, uh, I've given mostly a negative account of collective knowledge. So I've talked about what collective knowledge is not actually, and I've argued that it is not subjective knowledge where you just replace individual subject with a collective subject. So is there not anything else that we can say about collective knowledge? So it is just collective knowledge production. So it's just a joint activity, a collective uh, uh, realized uh, research process and nothing else. Um, I think epistemically there is more to examine there. Uh, I, I don't think the story ends there, uh, but I would say uh, it, is, it won't give us uh, knowledge in uh, the robust sense. So I wouldn't go for collective knowledge, but I would definitely go for uh, group assertions or group justification or group accountability, for example, which are all relevant uh, epistemic topics. Uh, and also in case of scientific collaborations, these are like very valuable themes to explore. And I would uh, indeed go on to explore these other themes, at least about group justification and about group responsibility, group credibility, group accountability. There are more things to say, definitely. And I would accept uh, or myself go for um, a more social account of, of these, uh, so a more irreducible group uh, property account of these. But I wouldn't do this for uh, knowledge. If we underst understand knowledge, uh, at least in some sense, close to the traditional sense. So in a way that accepts or accommodates epistemic dependence, but still is uh, the knowledge of individuals, knowledge individuals possess, a cognitive phenomenon, I would say. Did I miss anything? Uh, yeah, just only one question. So it was about the weak cognitive ability condition on knowledge. And I asked that, uh, what determines this significant degree of manifestation of the cognitive ability? Yes, uh, of course, this would be a question for uh, Pritchard himself, but I can answer that on his behalf. Um, a significant degree would, uh, I think, uh, give us a necessary component. So one's cognitive agency is a necessary feature or necessary factor in the acquisition of knowledge, uh, but it is not uh, the main target of, uh, it doesn't have to be the main target of, of credit. Uh, for example, you are relying on a very complex space telescope to, uh, identify uh, the location of a certain celestial object, then definitely your um, background knowledge in astronomy would uh, be a very significant element because some, some lay person wouldn't be able to decipher uh, the complex uh, symbolic information coming from the telescope. Uh, but definitely the telescope itself in being your information source without which uh, you wouldn't have the information at all, uh, that would be, I think, uh, the primary uh, target of, of, of credit in that case. So if you take that out of uh, the, the picture, uh, your causal account would be meaningless. But still, cognitive agency is uh, a meaningful part uh, because it is involved in decoding uh, that information or decoding that symbolic system uh, using background knowledge and so on and producing uh, the knowledge using that information resource, of course. So you cannot take that out of the system as well. Uh, but the bottom level uh, answer would be that uh, you have to mention one's cognitive agency and its involvement in a causal explanation of uh, the one's uh, epistemic success. So it shouldn't be a, uh, in a way uh, that is explainable merely on the basis of an uh, external information source. Thank you, your answers were so helpful. Thank you. I thank you for your comments and contributions. Okay, great. That's fun. That was fantastic. And we have almost 20 minutes for 
further discussion. So you all know, I guess, by now how to use the, the raise hand system. If for some reason you can't do that, put a question in the chat and we'll put you in the queue. And it's great to see two hands up already. So we'll start with um, Kirk Ludwig. Okay, thanks. I really enjoyed that. And um, I like the skepticism about the explanatory power postulating, you know, group subjects of knowledge and so on, and uh, the sort of minimalist approach to trying to understand how it, how it all works. And I was thinking about um, sort of structural similarities at, at smaller scales and thinking about then what's, what's special about the scientific case. And it seems to me that even in the individual case, there's something uh, uh, similar when you are, you can hold in your mind, for example, all of the steps in a proof, but then you get a proof that's too long. And then you have to remember that you prove something and then you use that. And it gets more complicated when you have to write it all out and then come back to what you wrote later. So if you write a book, you never have in your mind at one time or even over you know, a short period of time, all the things that are going on. Uh, and then the uh, an essentially different stage occurs when there's a social dimension of knowledge and rely on testimony from others. And that's part of what's going on in the scientific case as well, except the scale gets much larger. And um, some people think in the case of testimony that um, we should treat it as something like a basic source of information. So you're entitled to it and others have the human view. And I can see that kind of issue coming up in the scientific case as well. But there, it also seemed to me like the human view, since it's an institutional arrangement, which is sort of self-consciously designed, looks like it's much more plausible. So I, I don't know, I, I was thinking it might be um, interesting to think about the connection between the smaller scale cases of reliance on testimony and then what goes on in the scientific case. And it seemed to me that, that uh, one thing that, that you identified that looks really important is the uh, institutional structures that are designed specifically to ensure in these really large scale enterprises, the reliable transmission through forms of testimony of information so that they're available to others. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'm not muted. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the first example you give is uh, a perfect example of what people call extended cognition uh, using uh, external or mater material um, sources or vehicles uh, in uh, cognitive processes. Uh, and some people have uh, become uneasy when uh, this, such processes come to involve um, other minds as well, not just uh, external epistemic artifacts or cognitive artifacts. Uh, I guess their worry stems mainly from um, responsibility issues or accountability issues. But when we focus solely on the reliability aspect, actually, um, I, I don't think I, uh, we um, need to treat differently testimony from any other concern about reliability, really. Uh, for example, like in a virtue reliabilist framework, uh, which I basically operate in, uh, I trust my visual system, let's say, or I rely on my visual system. I don't even trust, uh, I blindly rely on my visual system to gain uh, perceptual knowledge. Uh, and since I have been born with it and I have been using it uh, for so much, so much time and it uh, turns in, uh, probably only the skeptic would deny, uh, but it turns in hopefully uh, mostly true uh, propositions than uh, false propositions. So I sort of blindly agree, uh, blindly rely on my perceptual system. Uh, I use it as a reliable cognitive ability or co cognitive tool. Do I have any better reason to rely on my visual system in this way than relying on testimony? If I can have, uh, for example, like, let's say, in the case where my perceptual uh, information uh, acquiring system sort of is maladaptive for some reason due to environmental, uh, let's say, uh, environmental, environmentally 
um, or externally uh, in favorable circumstances, let's say. I'm in a, a rapidly changing world or a parallel universe or something like that. Uh, or I'm drugged or, some, or any other factor that might uh, affect my uh, perceptual judgments. What do I do? I try to acquire, let's say, more, uh, more source, more uh, varied uh, information and justification to verify actually what I what I perceive. Right? I might go to the doctor. I might ask or try to be tested if I'm drug drugged, or I might try to ask others to get more uh, information about the type of world I'm in, and so on. I will try to combine many sources of information uh, to be a, in a better position to judge. Is it totally different, radically different from what happens with testimony? We have ways to identify uh, how people are trustworthy, general character, as well as epistemic competence, and so on, if, especially if we are in an iterated interaction context, like in uh, research collaborations and so on. So I think uh, we are basically in the same position. So testimony doesn't present a special case or other minds doesn't, don't present a special case. Whether it is our inbuilt organic information sources, like our inbuilt dispositions, or our scientific instruments, or other experts or other minds that we collaborate with, uh, the question is, I think the question fits into SOSA's framework. We can have knowledge, we can be said to have knowledge if we are relying on a, a reliable uh, knowledge information uh, generation process. Uh, but of course, we would be in a epistemically more valuable position. Uh, and sometimes this would be necessary depending on uh, the type of knowledge we are trying to get. Uh, we would be in a more valuable position if we also have some positive evaluation of our sources and their reliability. So I guess in the scientific context, um, we are not in a totally different scenario, but definitely such a highly complex uh, information. And especially since it is very hard to speak of truth actually, as we so easily do in epistemology, in uh, science and philosophy of science, the whole thing rests on your the reliability of your methodology, the reliability of your sources, instruments, and so on. Uh, there would be a much more uh, much more focus on the strength of your justification, and definitely in research collaborations, I think we can make an analog of this case of animal knowledge versus reflective knowledge uh, in terms of uh, how on the on one level your methods are good and fit to evaluate that research question with that means and so on. So how good is your scientific evidence? And what do you know and how do you assess the reliability of your scientific evidence? So a reflective mechanism realized on, on, on the systemic level. So I think just being a member of uh, both of these justification processes uh, would give us sufficient reason uh, to have scientific, uh, to, to accept scientific statements. And we are not in a position to ask more than this. Otherwise, we definitely end up denying scientific knowledge in really uh, the cases we don't want to deny scientific knowledge to individuals. I hope I, I answered your question and it was not too roundabout. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, too far. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think my strategy would be in this case just not use the term scientific knowledge and instead just say best scientific theories or something like that because I think the, no the, the term knowledge itself uh, is you know problematic. So then when we have this term knowledge, then we ask, okay, who whose knowledge is this, right? Who, who is doing the knowing? But if we are using the term knowledge, right, uh, here, then knowledge can be both proposition knowledge that or it can be knowledge how I right? know how um, but of, of course scientific knowledge is propositional right where we just assume it's proposition it can be written in books um, but do we have to do that so if we are talking about know how uh, then I think it might be more intuitive to attribute the knowledge to the group for example a band let's say a, a music band knows a song right so it cannot be, you can say this, you know, individual member, this individual member, no, it's the band, they, right? they know the song. 
how to play the song. Um, so like that, if uh, if there is know-how in uh, scientific knowledge, which again is taken to be propositional, I understand, but just make, can we expand, right, to understand uh, scientific knowledge? What know-how, for example, can be included in scientific knowledge? You know, how to produce it, how to like, you know, how to publish papers, things like that, how to conduct uh, experiments, for example, uh, how to evaluate it, how to uh, engage with uh, different uh, other scientists in conferences, I don't know, right? All that um, distribution even of the scientific knowledge, um, proposition side. So um, if there is know-how then in this, in scientific knowledge, then it might, or do you agree that it would be more intuitive to attribute scientific knowledge to the group rather than only the individual? Yeah, that's it. And okay. you can just say it is propositional knowledge and then I will say, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the question. This was also something I've uh, been thinking of. Um, I guess it was implicitly meant, uh, sort of uh, discussed in the paper, not very explicitly, uh, but I already commit to a, a group competence uh, notion. Uh, so I can, uh, I think we can speak of, and we should speak of a group competence, competence which is not reducible uh, to individual competences mm -hmm. uh, in a research group. So this would be, of course, made up of uh, the background knowledge uh, each each contributes, so the individual expertise each contribute. Uh, but also on the group level, we would speak of uh, a truly holistic or collective uh, competence, uh, which also includes the particular organization uh, and uh, the division of labor uh, that weaves together uh, all the, these different expertise and uh, background knowledge. So I, I guess uh, not only expertise, but also some sort of know-how would also enter the picture there. Because in a facility like CERN, for example, you have very complex um, scientific in instruments. You have the accelerators, you have the colliders, you have the detectors and so on. And there are many people there uh, who are not physicists, for example, but just mechanical engineers who are maintaining um, the systems. There are many data scientists, there are many, many statisticians. So uh, it is not only uh, physicists that make up, uh, up the group. And even if when, it, when, when it's the physicists, physicists are also divided among themselves, uh, like theoretical physicists, the experimental physicists, or the phenomenologists who derive the predictions from theories uh, to be tested by the experimental physicists and so on. So there is an extremely wide uh, and heterogeneous division of cognitive labor or scientific labor. So in some sense, definitely, it is not proposi only propositional knowledge, uh, I would say. Uh, definitely know-how is one part of it. And when you uh, sort of would um, uh, dissect the group, you would lose that uh, competence uh, that emerges at the group level, uh, which is fit to investigate that particular complex research question. Um, but I don't think so in re reference to my argument in this paper, but I don't think this competence uh, entails a group mind because competences, I guess, can be uh, considered or thought in non-mentalistic terms as well, uh, or like vague, vaguely cognitive, let's say, uh, or cognitive and non-mentalistic terms like Yer, for example, suggests. Uh, it is, uh, realizing a, a collective uh, complex process. So it can be considered as a performance as well. So when we are talking about collective performances, like even a collective dance performance or something like that, or for example, using uh, Hutchins's distributed cognition example, uh, example uh, many tasks in ship navigation, uh, like landing a sh ship to the port, for example, the task itself is the performance of landing a ship or like bringing it to the port. There is no other output than that. It is just the ship has been docked. Uh, and this performance uh, is collectively done. And I don't think anything mysterious there. Yeah, like no individual is creditable with the performance, of course, and the performance emerges at the collective level. And it is only a collective competence. So docking mm -hmm. the ship is a collective performance. I don't think this creates um, a huge problem uh, in the case of uh, collective knowledge. I, I guess it can to be totally accounted for uh, within the account I, I propose. 
like uh, collective production of scientific knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I uh, find it valuable to make the distinction between the production of knowledge and the possession of knowledge. Uh, so I don't think we have to make the jump from uh, this collective competence, which involves lots of non-propositional elements as well, uh, to group minds. I think that that's a huge jump that we do not need to make. Thank you. I thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I've got a question, but if anybody else has a question, now's your chance, yeah? Um, if not, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump in very quickly. Um, so Ludwig has his hand. Is that, a, is that a second hand? It's a new hand. Yeah, it was actually a follow-up on Tufan's question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that, um, you know, here the uh, multiple agents account or collective agency helps a lot because you get an, an, an account of what they do, which is a matter of each of them contributing. And then the competence is just a matter of, you know, what the disposition of the group is to make contributions to bring out one of the same event. And so that clearly requires no, you know, doesn't require a group agent, doesn't require a group mind. When two people lift a bench that neither one can lift alone, uh, you know, that's a exactly they have, right? But it doesn't mean there's another super agent there with its own mind and so on. And you just analyze it in terms of, you know, multiple agents making contributions, same event coming about. Thank you very much. Like exactly, I would uh, there uh, also did my argument in the paper. Like in, when I uh, progress to the full version or, or submittable version of this paper, I will definitely want to include a group agency uh, or collective activity account that, to uh, delineate it from uh, a collective knowledge account. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get this in in the remaining time. Um, and I don't know if, if there'll be time to reply to it. One thing you said in passing early on was about, well, you know, no, no group subject of knowledge without some kind of group subjectivity. And it's a very big claim to make that there are group subjective states. Yeah. So you know, when, you, when, you, when you sort of were criticizing Knossetina early on, you said, well, look, you know, we're making some big ontological claims here, right? One thing I wondered about was sort of affectivity and emotion, yeah? So one thing you might think about a scientific research team, yeah, is that, you know, there are certain kind of emotional states that are um, characteristic of the team that they are curious about things or that they're excited about their results and so on, yeah? Now, obviously, yeah, none of these things can be true without some things being true about the individual members of the group. But you might think that, you know, the group is excited, can't just be accounted for in terms of every, every single member of the group is excited, right? You might think that what's required is some kind of joint attentive focus, for example, on the thing that they're excited about. So I wonder whether you think that kind of consideration might also push us in, or might be something that could push us in the direction of accepting group epistemic subjects. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the question. Um, actually, I was expecting a more difficult question for me, uh, the way you began, uh, and I would just spill it. Uh, I was expecting something like a, a theory ladenness of research that comes uh, at the group level or something like that. For example, sharing a common scientific perspective, sharing a common methodological approach, and so on. I still have no definitive answer or, or, on, on, on such things, but uh, when it comes to uh, st states that are not strictly epistemic, um, I would uh, do dodge the question actually by uh, saying that, for example, we already have uh, scientific fields who are investigating such phenomena uh, like group uh, affectivity or um, group attitudes 
uh, or intergroup conflicts which are like motivated by psychological um, states and so on, uh, like social psychology, for example. And um, this is the, the sort of one of the main um, topics of investigation. So how people uh, become as a group agitated, for example, towards another group or how they become compassionate towards another group and so on. Uh, but they, for example, uh, as far as I observe, um, in terms of their history, uh, they also adopt uh, methodological individualism, at least since uh, some centuries uh, past two time, I would say, like, during those times, uh, collective subjects was a discussion, also in sociological social psychology, like in uh, psychological social psychology, but I guess they, as a field, gave up on um, collective subjects altogether and adopted, tried, uh, decided to adopt methodological individualism. So they uh, offer, um, let's say, weekly emergent accounts of, I guess, um, group uh, states like that, uh, based on personal states and interpersonal relations and so on. I don't think they, uh, or I'm pretty much pretty, pretty sure that they no longer um, propose uh, group entities at any level, uh, be it groups or institutions or states or nations and so on. So if they sort of uh, can manage to do that with like really such tough cases, unlike a propositional knowledge case, which is, I guess, uh, easier um, for me, if they are, able to do that. I guess methodological individualism uh, to some extent would uh, can apply or could apply to all cases of um, group mental, allegedly group mental states, I guess. I, I would uh, like I would like to uh, hear what you um, further think. I, I guess you might have some uh, misgivings, right? Yeah, I, I, I do, but I, I think the people probably need a break. I'll, I'll say that I'm not sure I agree with you about what the consensus is, hmm. but that might partly be because we disagree about who we should be looking for to for consensus. So I think there's quite a lot of literature within philosophy at the moment about probably collective I'd be, activity. And, and, probably and which I'm, that, I'm ignor, ignor, ignorant of. Uh, I, I would I, need to refer to you uh, for, for references actually for, for that literature really. Um, but, but maybe we should leave that there for now and correspond about this at a later sure. date. I would love to, I would love okay. to. Okay, okay, great. Okay, 